Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with Brooks, Alberta Mayor John Petrie. But before we get into today's episode, I want to take a moment and say thank you. Thank you to those who are continuously watching our show and sharing with your friends. Your engagement of our show makes us better, but it also gets our word out there and gets our mission out there to inform people about the everyday local elected leaders of this great country. So thank you so much. If you can, please hit that subscribe button right now so you can stay up to date on all of our greatest interviews that we have coming up for you. So now, on to our interview. Mayor Petrie, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start with sort of my basic question that starts off all my interviews. So you're no exception to this. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, John? Oh, you know, it's an interesting question because I think it evolved into where I got today. And it's, um, uh, you start, you get to a community and I didn't know anybody. So you start to get involved in the community. You know, I joined the chamber. I joined the Rotary Club. I was involved at that time in the EID Men's Slow Pitch League. So I got involved in that. I was in the Brooks Flag Football League. And one thing common about Brooks, and this was in the early 80s, is everybody or most people at that time were from somewhere else. So there was a common bond that we were all looking, you know, uh, for friendship. And so then I got involved and have developed good friendships that have been over 40 years now. But that's where it started. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, like I say, involved, you know, uh, uh, with these organizations, you know, the Chamber, the Rotary. I was, um, once my kids were uh, born, I, I, I was president of the Brooks Nursery School uh, board. I was trying to think of some of the other uh, uh, ones I was involved in. But one thing about those boards that you learn is you learn, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, to collaborate with other people. You learn how to run a meeting and, and you learn how to work with meeting uh, with other people. And, and it's not always, we always have our own ideas, but you also have to work with other people in order to get things done. And uh, that's sort of how I um, sort of maybe evolved into politics. I worked at the uh, radio station for many, many years. I was a reporter, so I covered city council too. And uh, I knew the workings of city council. I probably went into, when I uh, became a councillor, I probably knew more about the workings of council than most people. I knew, you know, what the uh, MPC did. I knew what the subdivision appeal board did. I, I, you know, I knew what rec board did. So when I got in there, I, I, I had a lot of background already. Now, to qualify that, uh, seeing it from another end, uh, what you see uh, uh, when you're in there is totally different sometimes on what it's like, uh, you know, when, when you're looking on the outside. I, I think, uh, you know, as a reporter, and I'm very empathetic to reporters, you know, like I talk to, to anybody, uh, it's, it's easier to be a reporter and ask the tough questions <laughs> than to try to answer the tough questions at my point here, at, at, at this point here. So well, I, 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 I kind of got involved that way. So, so it was an evolution. I don't think I had any um, sort of uh, big ambitions. I, I maybe thought of running for council. I never really had any ambitions to be mayor of Brooks. I kind of uh, evolved in that. And I can kind of explain how that happened if you want there too. We will in a few seconds, before, but before we get there, let's talk about young John here for a second. Growing up, was politics discussed at the dinner table? Was politics an interest of yours? Because as a former journalist myself, who have interviewed many people across this country, I, I got my political bug when I was a kid, Talk, sitting around the kitchen table, listening to my grandmother, my dad, my mom, my aunts and uncles all talk about politics at all levels. But for you, was politics discussed growing up and were you interested in politics until uh, at an early age or did it come later in life? Uh, two things. I was interested at an early age, but politics was not uh, discussed at home. I, I'm the son of an uh, immigrant. My dad, uh, uh, you know, came over from uh, Eastern Europe and we did uh, 
ta- he, he read the newspaper, you know, and maybe that's why I got my, uh, you know, I- uh, interest into politics. But I remember growing up, uh, 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 you know, uh, you know, watching, uh, like even in high school, I always watched the evening news. I, I, I grew up with Harvey Kirk and Lloyd Robertson, and I don't know what the interest was. I always had an interest in social studies. Just a little interesting antidote about politics is um, I was in grade six, it was, and we must have been doing social studies or it must have been, we, we, we had a we had a classroom election. And uh, uh, I noticed that the guys re- that were getting elected for president and vice president were the best looking and the most popular people in the, in, in the classroom. You know, and for some reason, I, I thought, well, you know, this isn't right. You know, and not to defame those guys, because I probably still know some of them today, is uh, I got up and I did a speech on that. They had the, the one opening left was for secretary of the thing. And, and I my speech and I remember this was grade six talking about, you know, uh, like you want to elect people, you know, uh, and I can't remember what it was, but don't base it on sort of uh, a- uh, aesthetics or looks or things like that. And I remember even in grade six getting a big applause from everybody and I got easily elected to that position. I didn't want secretary. That's the last <laughs> thing I wanted. But but I, but I felt at that time, even at the grade six level, there was uh, people were electing people for the wrong reason. So you initially put, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, no, I was going yeah, to go, go ahead there. Yeah, I was going to say, so you put your name forward and correct me if I'm wrong here, because I traditionally try to learn from my guests from them instead of trying to do a, a lot of research. But you initially put your name forward in the 2018 uh, municipal election, correct? That's your first uh, election that you put your name on the ballot, right? Yeah, 2017 it was. But my first, yeah, yeah my, my first election, I was... I was on school board for two terms. I was uh, 2010 and then 2013. And uh, because I, I had kids in the system there, I had asked to be on school board uh, years before that, but my kids were at an age where I thought, no, I, you know, I, I'm not going to give up uh, those things with my family. But by the time 2010 came around, they were a little bit older teenagers and, you know, they don't need as much, you know, uh, help anymore, you know, on that. So I, I was on school board uh, for, for two terms and my first election in, uh, so I, I moved on. I've always had an interest in municipal politics. So my first election was 2017. So the municipal one I want to talk about, but I want to yep. start back in the 2010, if you're okay with that. You, you get elected at the school board level, and this is an interesting conversation that I'm about to have here because you're probably the first one who's openly talked about this. You get elected in 2010. You get reelected in 2013 school board. The life of a school board trustee is a kind of a full-time job because you're dealing with a lot of issues that at the school board level. And then you say, I want to take that and I want to double it because I want to go on to city council. And it's a lot more experience and a lot more uh, sort of action that you see because you're dealing with a lot bigger issues. Was it an easy transfer, uh, transfer for you from going to that from that school board trustee position to that municipal councillor position? Were the the sort of the roles and responsibilities that you were dealing with at the school board level easy to transition from a person of your stature, a person who has been covering politics for some time and move them over into the municipal realm? Yeah, uh, definitely. And I, I, and I, I think uh, the issues at the municipal level are uh, a lot tougher than at the school board level because school board would be more provincial because a lot of the decisions are done provincially. You know, we would work on school calendars and, you know, I was fortunate enough that I didn't have to work on a school closing. I know some former trustees had to do that. And that's really tough too. And then, you know, uh, we're also responsible for hiring superintendents and, uh, you know, uh, uh, things like that. But, uh, uh, but you knew that the job, the local level as a school board trustee, you go into the the grocery store, you're going to be stopped. So you well, knew sort of the, the role that you're getting into municipally, because so many times municipal politicians, I find, get involved and they don't realize it's a part time job with full time hours. <laughs> well, yeah, well, exactly. You, you talk about the full time hours. It doesn't matter uh, where I go. I go for a walk in the morning and and I, I tell people I, like I get a lot of opinions, uh, you know, from you know, people will stop me. They know who I am. They'll talk about certain things. And and, and for the most part, it's pleasant, you know, and I, I try to answer them or say, OK, I'll look that up or I'll, I'll find about uh, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, 
about that, whatever, you know, I go to the grocery store, uh, people will stop and approach me. Uh, I go to the bandits games all the time. People will kind of approach me. I know I have a guy that I sit beside me uh, at the bandits games. He's a former counselor. He says, no, you, you know, like you shouldn't answer that, whatever, because you know, you're, you're off duty. And I said, but uh, I'm on duty all the time. It's, it, it's 24 seven, you know, and, and I, I, I respond to, you know, with at the municipal level, I respond to everybody. I, you know, I, uh, if there's an email or a concern, I always, I, you know, I, I try to phone them back because it's easier to talk than to respond on an email because I, I, I don't like that email thread, you know, and a lot of times, uh, you know, whether it be the school board or, you know, municipal uh, council, people just want to be heard. You know, and, 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 you know, and a lot of times I, I know there, there's one uh, individual lady there. She talked for about 45 minutes, you know, and, and, you know, like, and I'm letting her talk and, you know, she can go on and on. And, and, and you try to solve the problems. And in some cases, you can't solve the problems, you, you know, but, but you, try, you, you try to work on the problems. But in most cases, people are just happy to be heard. That's all they want to do is be heard. Just an interesting little thing about, uh, you know, uh, getting out in the community there. We had a debate in uh, council as in the last term and uh, Brooks Mayor Barry Morishita, well, he was the mayor at the time there, but it was about the train whistle going through town. And, and the train whistle still blows and it, it seems to bug a lot of people. And there was a debate on council. We had basically had money set aside because we had to do the security for the train whistle to stop. But I went out and I talked to a lot of people on that. I talked to elderly people. And when I went out for a walk or when I was out and about, I tried to get the demographic uh, uh, feel, you know, like I talked to older people, older people, a lot of them like the train whistle because, you know, it, it was part of our heritage. Younger people, they didn't care. And so I, you know, most of the people that I talked to about that, uh, still like the train whistle so when we came to the vote i think the vote was four three to keep it it was a close vote but it's sort of an example of some grassroots uh, level you know discussion on you know getting back uh, or finding out what the community wants there now you've been in municipal politics for six years now four years as a councillor two years as yep. mayor you're literally coming up to the your halfway part uh, mark on your first term so congratulations on making it two yeah. years um, yeah. um the role of municipal governance has changed a lot over the last 10 years. And I say that as someone, as an observer, but for someone who has observed municipal politics as well, you have probably seen it change as well. We are seeing a blurring of jurisdictional lines in this country right now where residents, and I paint a broad stroke with this question all the time, and I hate doing it, but I have to ask, are you as mayor seeing more people come to you with more provincial federal issues or do they understand the the jurisdictional roles and responsibilities that the municipal government has to play in their day-to-day -day life? Uh, no, you know, they do, you know, it might be a federal issue or a provincial issue. And, and I do get a lot of that and I have to direct them. I said, no, you know, uh, uh, you know, that's out of my jurisdiction. But I'll give you an, an example of where that's filtered down into our end here now. A and that's with local doctors and nur nurses and healthcare. But, like healthcare should be a provincial issue. We shouldn't have to deal with that at the municipal level here. But in any community, and I think you were at Alberta Municipalities, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago there too, you know, it was a general theme. Municipalities, we, we have to go out and we have to sell our communities now in order to get doctors and nurses and staff here. So, so there is something that's sort of a provincial issue that's crossed down into, you know, the municipal issue there, too. And, you know, a lot of things cross through, you know, I, I mean, that, you know, uh, housing is uh, an interesting one that should be municipal, provincial and, and you know, uh, federal. But there's a economic development should also be, you know, like minis uh, municipal, uh, provincial and federal too. Uh, but so we're crossing all three barriers. So, well, we have to look after that pothole on second street or the litter over on fourth Avenue, or uh, what did I get one the other day? Just, you know, like a, like a water bill issue. You know, you know, we also have to deal at different levels of government now too. Yeah. And, you know, uh, uh, I was in sales at the radio station for many years. Now it's sort of transitioning from selling radio advertising to selling the community and trying to get uh, things for our community here now. While you were dealing with more provincial and federal issues, whether it be healthcare, education, whether it be this, that, or the other, 
uh, it probably was exacerbated by the uh, the pandemic. There are probably a lot more responsibilities and a lot more uh, misunderstandings on what the municipality's role is. Municipalities are picking up sort of where the federal and provincial governments are kind of dropping the ball. And I say that in the grand scheme of things, not yeah. saying that they are. I'm just saying that maybe there's a little bit of downloading here and there. Maybe municipalities are picking it up because the province is they're waiting for the province to come to the table. How do you balance the needs of your municipalities' local issues with balancing the needs of the issues that people come to you with that say, hey, we need a better healthcare funding, and that takes time out of your day. That takes time out of your day where you could be looking into local issues, and now you're actively talking about provincial issues rather than local issues. Yeah, ironically, though, uh... Uh, and I'll go back to healthcare as an example. While it's a provincial issue, uh, the 15,000 people in uh, the city of Brooks are still my responsibility. And again, if we don't have healthcare here, which is again, a provincial issue, you know, uh, if we don't have the doctors, do we have people leave a community then? You know, so does our population decline? We have to make my job as mayor and as council is to try to make it the best community for everybody. And, and so we need so many of those other things that, uh, you know, are on the provincial or the federal level in order to make our community appealing, uh, especially rural communities where we struggle, you know, uh, to get a lot of things, including uh, people sometimes. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's staffing, it's interesting with staffing, you know, our council had a, a discussion even with our school board and they run into the same problem. We talk about uh, doctors and nurses. They they struggle in getting teachers. And, and one of the issues they had, and it's kind of interesting on that, is the young teachers, uh, uh, you know, they're looking for companionship too. And, you know, it's not like they can go on Tinder or whatever in Brooks here to find somebody, you, you know. And, and so sometimes the, the younger people leave the community just you know you know because they want a relationship too so so they move uh, out so so those those are factors that we we have to consider we have to work on here i never thought in a million years would i be talking to the mayor of a city and the topic of tinder would come up but <laughs> yeah. here we are in 2023 yeah. where mayors have to deal with a lot of issues i, I want to talk about the 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 local aspects of the job because you make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis, on a weekly basis that impact your residents the next day. And you don't go off to Ottawa to do your job. You don't go off to Edmonton to do your job. You're in your local community. How do you balance, how do you as mayor, before we talk about the issues, how do you balance the needs of the community against the needs of the individual? Because you can't please 100% of the people 100% of the time. As much as you try, you're never going to do it. How do you make sure that people feel like they're being heard in your community without being forgotten on their important issues and how they're feeling with the decisions you've made? I think, and this probably goes back to my rotary, and I'm still involved in rotary, is uh, when you make a decision, you have to make a decision that's beneficial to all. Or to the uh, to most people, there are things that I would like individually, but maybe it only benefits me. But if it doesn't benefit the entire community, and and I hope that all council sort of looks at that too. And and I think in a lot of cases, politicians will do uh, uh, they'll cater to a select group of people. And, and and the problem we have in a lot of cases is uh, that small group of people uh, can set the tone. And, and, and I often see politicians making a major decision uh, with, with, because they're afraid of that small group of people. And, and uh, I kind of can relate, uh, and I'll, I'll kind of maybe use my radio days too, because I was the manager of the radio station, is uh, if, if there was a complaint about something, maybe one or two people didn't like a song or maybe an ad or something like that, I wouldn't, okay, well, that's understandable. But then if there's a lot of people, you know, that are phoning, and uh, commenting on something, now you sort of have to take action. But you also have to uh, look at uh, everything holistically too. What's the benefit of everybody in the community? I think what happens a lot of times, uh, maybe, I, I hope it doesn't happen, at the, it does happen at the municipal level because I, I've covered enough council meetings where a small group of people basically can uh, uh, crowd uh, a city hall and make decisions and, and I look back even in the city of Brooks, some decisions that have been made in the past just because one 
people of the community, one, people, uh, one group of people in an area of the community didn't like something and it affected everybody in the community there. So you, as a councillor, as mayor, and I think everybody, you should look at it, okay, what's the benefit to the most people in the community on that and not to this particular group of people? So how do you judge that? How do you as mayor judge that? Because there's an apathy in this country when it comes to municipal politics and people just don't seem to be getting involved as they used to be like 10, 15, 20 years ago. I, I, you see a lot more acclamations. You see as a former communications person for a community, I know that you put out surveys, you get 100 results and you're happy with 100 results of a town of 5,000 people or 10,000 people and you're excited. Is there an apathy in the city of Brooks that when you ask for opinions to sort of make your decision around that council table, people will give them? And how do you then sort of weed through that to make sure that you're making sure that it does impact the majority of the people and not just the people who are vocal? I think you have to, you know, those 100 people, 150, and it's probably no different. I don't, you know, a, a lot of times we do the surveys and, and we get 150 responses back. And a lot of times, uh, you know, I look at it, I say, we have 15,000 people, 10% uh, re response back would be, you know, 1,500 people, 1%. We're getting 1% of the people responding. And in a lot of cases, the people that do respond to those are the ones that have a real issue with a uh, decision made or an upcoming decision made by council. You try to, you, you know, uh, get when I say upcoming decision, you try to get those things out ahead of time. You don't want to be making any decisions in secret on, uh, on that because then you're into a lot of trouble on, on that. So you want to, you, you know, we do all the open houses. And so what, what you do, you know, you do the surveys, you do the open houses, you know, you have your public hearings. So you do give people an opportunity and you have to listen to everybody because it, it's amazing. Sometimes there's things that come up uh, that we never think of or you don't think oh you know that I never thought about that from that person you know that that makes a really good sense you know so it might make you decide in the end you know uh, again hol holistically or you know like like everything okay well may maybe this is uh, uh, better for the entire community. Now, I just realized we're at 20 minutes and we haven't even gotten to our second segment yet because this is the great thing about the show. Time just yeah. flies by with all the questions. So I want to turn to the second segment. I want to talk about the city of Brooks as a whole now. And before I start this conversation, I want to sort of preface it by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. We get emails about this question all the time. I don't yeah. know why, but people just don't understand it's an opinion. So. Your Worship, Mayor Petrie, in your opinion, as of recording this episode, what do you see are the biggest issues or issue facing the city of Brooks today? Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the first one will be sort of one that's sort of common right across the country, and, and, and that will be the lack of housing. Uh, the second one would be a little bit more uh, broader. But uh, I can talk about the lack of housing, uh, first of all, but, you know, I was at uh, FCM in Toronto and it was interesting. It didn't matter, you know, the people you spoke to, whether they were, uh, you know, from Toronto, uh, Cape Britain or Capus Casing or Brooks, you know, we're all lacking housing. So that that's an issue we all have to work on together, you know, at the municipal level, the provincial level, you know, and, and the, the federal level. We have to look for solutions. We have to look for solutions, and, and I, I hate this word outside the box, but we have to come up with, you know, something in, in order to solve that. Because if, if you have kids or young families, you, you, you want them to have what we have, you know, whether it be a house in the backyard or whatever they want, whatever. You don't want them to be indebted, uh, you know, to a high mortgage for the rest of their life. So, 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 so that's one of the issues I think we have, you know, you know in, the, in the Brooks area. But I say it's, it's the same right across uh, Canada there. So can, I, can, I, pick, can, can but, I pick yeah. up on that before you talk yeah. about the next? Because, because I, I love when people talk about housing and I want to know right here, right now, what about housing is an issue for Brooks? Is it the lack of housing? Is it the lack of diverse housing? Is it the lack of builders coming in to build the housing that you have potentially available, that you have developed uh, land that you have able to be developed? What are what are you when you talk about housing? Is it just lack of housing, or or is it more complex than just that? You no, know, I think it would be the lack of housing, 
and um, uh, the lack of rental units. And I'll give you an example here. Our biggest employer in town uh, had an opportunity to bring 250 Ukrainians in, 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 into Brooks. 250 people in a small community. I mean, it, 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 that's a big impact. You know, that, that's, that, that's one case here too. But, you know, they didn't come here. They didn't have uh, uh, housing, no rentals. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the schools uh, were full. I, I kind of questioned that one there too, but, 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 but no transportation. So three out of the four, they're, they're right on that. And I know you had interviewed uh, Councillor Idris, and he's uh, with Brooks and County Immigration Services. The federal government asked him to bring 300 new Canadians into Brooks here. Same thing. You know, where are we going to put them? And, and, you know, when we talk about econo economic development in a small town like Brooks, we're always, you know, we need that other little business. I look at uh, that new, was it McCain's uh, factory in Coaldale where they're bringing in, you, you know, uh, 250 people. You know, we would love to have something like that. But how do we even go out and try to market something like a small industry like that where we have no place to put them? And the problem we have, and it will transition into what I want to talk about next, is uh, how do we bring developers into Brooks? And you know, and what we've done here, we've done, we've discounted our land, uh, you know, uh, uh, for developers, and we've come up with some, with some incentive plans too. You know, like uh, if you build a house or an apartment building, uh, you wouldn't have to pay any of the municipal property taxes for the first year. For the second year, you get a 75% break, the third year, a 50% break, and the fourth year, a 25% break. So if, if you're looking at property taxes, if you're building a house, that would save somebody about $10,000, which again, they could put to their uh, mortgage. If you're building an apartment building, an apartment building of $15 million is what a 40 unit apartment would be. You would, you know, like uh, with the mill rate, I don't want to do the math on it in my head, but it, you would save a lot of taxes in those four years to basically almost pay for the cost of the land or a good chunk of the apartment to get some cash flow going in that apartment. So, 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 so we've taken the incentives, you know, almost three ways, you know, like uh, off offering the, the discounted uh, taxes of uh, discounted uh, land sales. And, and you can only, as you know, with the MGA, you can only do it so much because you can't, if, if you put it down to zero, and then the guy's property next door, you know, was, is, bought his uh, uh, lot for 80000 automatically, you know, the assessment goes down everywhere. That's the way it works. So I believe it works that way. But yeah. So I, I kind of I think I'm going to transition here a little bit into your second uh, issue that you're dealing with, but you, you talk about the need for housing, people to develop the houses, but you know developers won't come unless there's a need for res like if there's residents there who will actually buy the houses or actually yep. rent the houses, but people won't come until the developers build the houses right yeah. now. So you're stuck. Municipalities like Brooks are, is stuck between a rock and a hard place because you're trying to attract residents, but you're trying to attract developers at the same time. And developers won't come unless residents, residents won't come without developers. How do you deal with that? Because I can imagine you're hitting your head against the wall, trying to figure out how to get both here at the same time, but understanding that one won't come without the other and the other won't come without the other. Uh, I'll give you um, uh, and around Calgary, it, you know, uh, uh, like uh, Okotoks, Cochrane, Airdrie, and even Strathmore do not have the same problem because uh, there's a new 500 unit development coming up in Cochrane there, right? Eh? But but those guys, the developers, can build that 500 unit uh, uh, development, knowing that they're probably going to sell 100 percent of those. If we build, let's say, uh, 50 homes here. You know, does the developer take a risk of selling those 50 homes? And if you sit on even one or two empty lots with a higher interest rate now, uh, you know, it's going to cut into, you know, their profit margins, which we, you know, we don't, uh, you know, want to happen there. But what we're doing, you know, we're talking to some of the maybe smaller developers, you know, that are coming into town, you know, that will build, uh, you know, uh, four plexus or a six plexus. So we have to do it really small. We're not going to get the big developments they have around Airdrie and Cochrane and Okotoks, but maybe slowly we can do that. And the issue, and, and I brought up this issue to uh, 
uh, you know, municipal affairs to, you know, one, one problem we have here, again, with the, the low development is a lot of times, like in an area, we need the infrastructure costs, you know, and, uh, you know, a, a lift station, you know, and so you're looking at six or $7 million and a developer is not going to, for, for a lift station, if, and I don't know if they need lift stations, that they obviously do in Calgary or Cochrane or Airdrie, but then you divide the, the cost and it, it's uh, because of the economies of scale, it's pretty small per unit, but in a small our community uh, that makes it tough and again that chicken and egg thing if we don't have housing we don't attract anybody new and I had told my council a while back as we were going in there we have to find a way now of getting some development whether it be commercial industrial or residential into our community because we went through a nice period of 20 years with really low interest rates and taxes were you know maybe one or two percent a year but it's costing, uh, we just signed a new agreement with QP. RCMP costs are going up. You know, the rec center is going up. So we have the same amount of people paying for the increased costs on, on everything. And if we don't get new development to offset that cost, our taxes, our property taxes are going to go up every year on that. Do you have buy-in from the community about building new houses? Because we, we talked earlier about the provincial, federal, and municipal governments need to come together. But we always forget about the fourth party that needs to also champion these uh, new developments. And that's the residents. Because you need buy-in from residents to potentially build, uh, to pass land use bylaw changes, to pass to development zone changes. Do you have buy-in from the residents of Brooks to say, hey, we want people to come here. We want to build a 40 new a 40 uh, house apartment building uh in our community so that way people come so that will lower your taxes like is there buy-in and, yeah well and, and, and you know and that's the sales pitch I, and i don't care if you're making a lot of money <laughs> you know i mean a, a person that owns uh you know like a five or six hundred thousand dollar house is paying a lot of property taxes i says oh, if we don't do this you're going to be paying a lot more you know, on that. And we do have a young demographic here. And, and so maybe there's, there's not much pushback on that. You do get always a segment of every community is that old NIMBY thing, whatever. I'm quite happy the way it is. I'm quite happy, you know, the community should not change, whatever, you know, like, like we're I'm quite happy where it is now. But I say, if, if we don't grow or find a way to grow, you know, your, our property taxes are going to go up and up. And if our property taxes go up and up, you know, uh, people are going to move away there too. Eh? So, so before I interrupted you, after you were talking about housing, you said there was another uh, issue that you the, that's facing the city of Brooks. Is it the development or is it something else? Well, you know, in a way, you know, and I call it the uh, urban uh, rule divide, you know, and um, uh, and I, I don't know. Where are you from, Chris? Well, originally from Ontario, but I'm, I'm based in Calgary. Uh, okay, uh, you know, I, I used to joke with people about the rural urban divide is uh, I used to make fun of people in Toronto, not really knowing where they get their steak from, or where they get their gasoline from, they get their steak down from the grocery store over at Safeway, or they get the gasoline down at the, the service station at Shell, you know, but you know, that same sort of thing is happening here in Alberta, where a lot of people, maybe in the urban centers, don't know where, you know, like the uh, the products are coming from, the agriculture products, their steak is coming from, their oil and gas. We do the dirty jobs out here. We do all the dirty jobs. We do oil and gas. We do uh, farming. We do, you know, I'm not in a, a forestry area, but, the, you know, the, the forestry. We look after the landfills, you know, whereas the people in the city, I know they have different uh, issues, but they're making policies that uh, you know are affect that could affect us in the rural area here. So I, you know, I talk about this ur uh, urban rural divide. Uh, uh, so you know, do you have uh, a good working relationship with your counterpart, the Reeve of Newell County? Oh, yeah, Arnold, uh, Arnold Dorkson and uh, us in the county, we have a great relationship. Yeah, yeah. No, no, we're really fortunate because I, I, I hear stories around the province about uh, sort of issues between uh, uh, urban and rural, whatever. No, no, you know, and that's one thing. And I know I was looking back when I was uh, preparing for this, looking back on some of my notes here. And one is to, you know, uh, make sure that we have a good relationship with the county. You know, I get along well with Arno and uh, most of the county councillors. And yeah, we have a really, they're in the same boat you know uh, you know like even though we're a city we're still rural we're and they're still rural too and they're fighting the same things we are so we're jointly uh you know fighting together for um uh sort of some prominence in the rural area now, you mind me asking why you think that that is 
Why do you that, think that there's an urban-rural divide in this country, even in Alberta? Let's just stay with Alberta here for a second, because I think you're right. Because I was talking to a councillor from Cypress County about the state of agriculture disaster that they declared back in July. And he said that if the the agricultural community doesn't see a, a increase in uh, precipitation, the cost of beef is going to go through the roof next year because a lot of farmers are dealing, a lot of ranchers are dealing with some issues around keeping their livestock around during the winter months. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that the urban communities, and I, I, I hate to put you on the spot here, but you opened up the line of questions and I want to ask, why do you think that is? Why do you think that there is an urban rural divide in this country and we don't see a unifying cohesion of one Alberta, one Canada? And it goes back to what I said, you know, the, the people in Toronto, they don't know where they get the steak from. They don't know where they get the gasoline from. Uh, uh, people in Calgary are, and I say Calgary because it's only, you know, 200 kilometers down the road there too, you know, and at one time, like Calgary and Edmonton were made up of rural people, like probably 20, 30 years ago, if you ask somebody in Calgary, wherever they were from, they said, oh, you know, I was from Brandon, Manitoba, or I was from Rosetown, Saskatchewan, or something like that. But but Calgary, uh, you know, most of the people, a lot of the uh, people, People in Calgary are there's there's a large immigrant population that doesn't know really about um, you know the rural area or there's a lot of people that were uh, uh, born and raised in Calgary that have never been on a farm they've never seen a cow they've never seen you know like chickens or things like that you know so I think th they don't do it deliberately it's just sort of subconsciously and then you know they're making decisions because our population, uh, the, the biggest chunk of our population is in Calgary and Edmonton, you know, so you're making decisions, you know, like at that level, because they got the uh, MLAs or, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, the bigger population that can affect us in the rural area here too, you know, so. Uh, does it, ben it, does it, it benefit you that you have the premier as your MLA? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we're, we're hoping it will be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what and, and it's interesting going into the election because i i was tapped by a lot of outside media there and and, and my, my general comment was you know when she was running in the area here is that you know i think everybody was giddy you know okay we could have the premier in the area and with the premier you do want some advantages you, 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 but but we haven't seen any big ones yet you, you know that you know that I'm looking for. So we're we'll, we'll give her a chance on that. You know she's got four years here too, eh? But but and I I also know uh, you know what she's under too. She can't cherry pick uh, uh, certain things. I mean I think Don Getty did. So uh, we kind of kind of use that as a base. If you remember that Don Getty gave the uh, Western Canada lottery thing to Stetler after he won a, a by election there too. But uh, we we hope there is a conduit, a better conduit to maybe our other government officials because we do have the premier in our riding here. So I, I want to sort of flip the question about issues on its head a little bit here with you. So you talk about housing, you talk about the urban rural divide and the, the misunderstanding of where things come from. But if I go talk to 100 people in Brooks, they'll give me 100 different answers on what they believe is the biggest issue. Now, you as mayor, you as council have to look at all those individual issues and try to figure out how to ac accomplish their issues and make their issues important. But you know, and I know, that you don't have a lot of money. Municipalities are struggling financially right now because you have big projects, infrastructure projects that you have to deal with. How do you balance the needs of the community with the individual? Because you want to make sure that the individual feels like they're welcome here, but they're also getting their issues and their money's worth when they're paying their taxes. And if they say, hey, John, I have a pothole in front of my house that needs to be fixed, and it's been like that for three years, when is it going to happen? That pothole to them is the most important thing in yeah. their life right now so how do you balance the needs of the community issues with the needs of the individual issues that's probably the most difficult uh, aspect at, at the municipal level and and i call it sometimes people it works two ways you know some people have champagne tastes and we have a limited budget in order to, to, to pay for that. You know, some people want, oh, you know, like, you know, they got this in Medicine Hat or they got this in Calgary. Why can't we have that here? And I'm thinking, OK, we're only 15,000 people here. You know, you know, we, we, we have to be realistic in, in, in how in what we get here or, you know, what we can do here. But, you know, well, some people have the champagne taste. 
you have the other group of people. There's the other segment that doesn't want anything done. Like if, if uh, you know, we, we got some proposals, you know, on the bo books and they say, you know, why do we need that? Whatever, you know, we, we don't need that, you know. So, so you get a group of people that say, you know, you know, uh, yeah, you, you're, you're wasting money, you know, to do that. A good example of that will be, uh, you know, and this worked with the, our final council and Morishita was on council at the time and the mayor at the time, you know, uh, we had a plan to bring in, the, you know, the uh, fiber optic, uh, you know, internet to the community. And my philosophy was I, I believed in that. And especially what we learned during the pandemic is that, you know, you didn't have to be on the 20th floor in Calgary in order to run, uh, you know, like uh, be in an office anymore, or you didn't have to be in San Francisco. You, you know, you, you could be in, if we had the high speed, internet maybe that's a way we could attract people from calgary to brooks you know and, and we had to invest you know five million of our own dollars into that and so then you get the pushback well you know sean tell us are doing fine with it now you know you know why do that but you know they're not they're not they're not looking what we're looking with, you know, the fiber optics, you know, on that, you know, where we could maybe start a, uh, you know, like a business could come into town or, you know, if you're doing CAD drawings or things like that, yeah, I have to upload uh, even what you do, you know, like uh, uploading video or downloading video or things like that. So we looked at that as an opportunity, but there's an example of going out of the way to try to get something for the community with a lot of potential in the future on that. Can I ask about that? Because I know that in the, in my conversation with Councillor Idris and Councillor Wardrop, the few, like last year and even yeah, uh, yeah. earlier this year, they were talking about that issue. And then I saw it when I was out in Brooks when I was driving through. I saw the big giant signs. How how's the rollout been of that fiber optics? Because correct me if I'm wrong here, because you're the mayor and you should know this, and I don't know it as much as you do, but. The city owns the fiber optic network. You charge yeah. for the fiber optic network and people buy into it. Are you seeing it? Because this is kind of a revolutionary idea that a city is going through in providing uh, internet services for their communities to buy. Are you seeing buy-in from the community? Uh, slowly. You know, okay. uh, yeah, I think the, the big challenge we have is because they're putting in the uh, fiber optics, uh, you know, below the ground and, you know, they're digging up lots and things like that. So people aren't too happy, you know, about the aesthetics of their property and things like that. But this isn't the first one. Olds did with Onet. And, and this is sort of where I initially got the idea from. They, they were well ahead of the game there. And they were able to bring in some industries around uh, Olds because of Onet there too. But uh, yeah, we're kind of hoping maybe the same thing. It, 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 it's a gamble we have to take. You know, like in order to attract people, you know, especially young people to stay in our community. And I don't care, you know, whether you're talking about Drayton Valley or Lloyd Minster or Brooks or a lot of the what I call really the, the smaller places in order to keep younger people here. If you can kind of give them that super high speed Internet, you know, where they don't have to be you know, in Calgary or San Francisco, I say San Francisco because a lot of people from San Francisco actually moved to Boise, Idaho, you know, because of the internet there, right? But that's sort of an example I, I, I use in that. So, our, you know, again, house prices here would be a lot cheaper than what they are in Calgary, where they're starting to get higher and higher. So maybe we can, and maybe a developer will see this and say, you know, this is a good opportunity to maybe develop something out here, you know, with that potential of, you know, the uh, fiber optic network. Now, now, you've mentioned the young Canadians, young Albertans who are sort of moving away because they might not have the business opportunities, might not have the relationships. But give me a silver lining that there, there, there's somewhat of a slowdown of that tide, people leaving and people are actually might be staying in the community, whether they be 25 to 40 years old, potentially even moving out from Medicine Hat to settle into Brooks because it's more of a uh, family community. And I say that with respect to Medicine Hat because I never want to throw any municipality under the no, bus. No, no, yeah, yeah. But do you see some young families and younger Albertans and Canadians and even new families, new Canadians coming into Brooks now? Uh, um, I don't know. If, uh, I'm trying to think if there's new. I, I think if the new families come in, they they might be the young professionals, whether they be uh, you know the teachers or the nurses or the uh, the, the 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 young doctors. But I'm kind of hoping that you, you certainly seen that. And I use Calgary because they're they're down the road. But you know they they got massive migration from Toronto, like a lot of people from Ontario, because the cost of living is so high there. And, and Vancouver. I'm at, <laughs> and, Van, and and Vancouver too. And I look at, I look at it from the other way too. Maybe in Calgary, you know it, you know uh, if you can't afford a 
$600,000 house here. You could have a nice $300,000 house here, which is probably bigger than the one in Calgary. And, you know, like your kids are only three minutes away from any school. You know, we, we got a nice lake to the south of us and, you, you know, and really we're only two hours away from an international airport. You know, people in, in Toronto, it, it, uh, to go to Pearson have to travel more than what I have to go from Brooks to, you know, the Calgary airport, you know, to, to you know, to take a flight. And it's an easy route with the Trans-Canada Highway and the Stony, the Stony Trail there too. So, so, so we have the amenity. Well, we can live off of Calgary a little bit. We can use that to help promote, you know, life in a small town. Uh, you know, and again, like I say, it, it's easy to get to the grocery store or easy to get to Canadian Tire, you know, whereas in Calgary, it's going to be a 45 minute drive. When your uh, uh, young son or daughter needs that fishing rod for Monday morning and it's Sunday for <laughs> her phys ed class. And I've been in that situation uh, because I could just I could just go basically almost, you know, down the down the street to get it from Walmart, whatever. But I, I use that as an example. So I want to turn to my last segment here, and it's sort of on the same vein, but I want you to promote Brooks to me for a few minutes here. Uh, I'm a big proponent of tourism from the municipal standpoint. I think that Canadians should be spending their economic dollars here in Canada, like I do, visiting these great communities that sort of have a story to tell and some great tourism aspects. For you, if there was a tourist coming through Brooks tomorrow, what would you tell them that they need to see or do in the community? You know, the, the first thing I usually do, uh, uh, I sort of brag about uh, the community and I, I talk about the importance of irrigation to the community because uh, uh, without irrigation, we're nothing. So, you know, we got the aqueduct here, the uh, the forefathers of this country, you know, like when, when they wanted to develop the West, they brought in, you know, the, the Bizano Dam and irrigated here. And because of that, you know, uh, you know, we grow great crops around here. We have JBS Foods because, because of that. You know, that's one aspect. Dinosaur Park is close by here, too. I, you know, the funny thing about uh, Dinosaur Park, I grew up in Drumheller. And, uh, uh, you know, I explored the Badlands, you know, and then somebody, when I moved out here, somebody says, you got to see, you, you got to see Dinosaur Park. And I said, well, how are you going to impress me with Dinosaur Park? I grew up in Drumheller and I, I, I was picking uh, dinosaur bones out of the hills and petrified wood before you even thought about it, whatever. But I went out to Dinosaur Park and I was just fascinated by it. You know, just the vastness of it. And a lot of time, times, even to this day, we go down there for hikes and for walks and things like that. But we also have, you know, like we have a lot of man-made lakes around here. And like Lake Newell, I've often, and I know it was in one of my campaign speeches too, if, if we can find a way to develop that a little bit more, I often say, why can't we be the Sylvan Lake of the South? And I know what Sylvan Lake does, you know, like, you know, they bring in a ton of people, you know, like in the summertime and the economic benefits to that community are immense. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, if we can do much the same, you know, with uh, uh, the Rolling Hills Reservoir, Crawling Valley, or, you know, uh, Lake Newell, that would be, I think we have a lot of potential there. And our climate down here, I know we're a little bit lower, but, you know, basically from Mother's Day weekend to Thanksgiving weekend, I think like this, uh, it's Thanksgiving weekend, I don't know when this will air, but, you know, it's going to be 23 or 24 here. So you could still be out on a boat when the uh, water's high enough, whatever, but, it, you, you know, uh, those are things we tell people, but people that come from Ontario, when I talk about Lake Newell, they, they laugh at me because they have so many, well, you're from Ontario, you would know that uh, you guys are uh, surrounded by so many lakes, but for us, uh, you know, in the desert here, and we're in the desert, we've had less than three inches of rain this year. And uh, if you look it up, they probably get more rain in the Mojave Desert than what we get uh, get here. We've done a tremendous job. I, just to, while you talk about uh, Brooks and, and promoting Brooks, you know, uh, we have done very well with our new Canadians. We have 35% new Canadians here. We have a visible minority of almost 50%. We worked hard in order to, uh, you know, enhance that. That's, to me, you know, that's a major asset in attracting people, you know, you know, to our community it, it is our immigrants. And, and in, in a small community, uh, immigrants stick out uh, no different than years ago. If you were in any a small community in Canada, you know, the guy that had, you know, the, either the Chinese laundry mat or the Chinese restaurant uh, stuck out. But, you know, we've done so well in trying to integrate, you know, like a lot of the uh, different ethnic communities. We just had the Taste of Nations here, which is, uh, you know, where all, all the nations, whether it, it uh, be Nigeria or 
uh, you know, all, all those uh, Ethiopia, uh, you know, like, like they, they do their foods and, and everybody can kind of gather. But but we do we work very hard, you know, as making uh, uh, immigration like an asset. It's an asset to our community. And 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 again, a, a lot of our uh, our new uh, people that come maybe into the rural area or into Canada will be immigrants. So maybe we can say, you know, uh, you're going to feel at home here. I can say without the without a lie that I, I when I went to Brooks uh, earlier this year, I sat down with Councillor Idris and Councillor Wardrop because they came on the show and yep. I will be doing it with you as well. And I'm pretty sure, 99.9% sure, I had the most hottest dish I've ever had from a <laughs> Korean restaurant. I believe it was a Korean restaurant. I could be wrong. Councilor Idris and Wardrop are probably yelling at the screen right now, telling me that no, it wasn't Korean. Uh, and it was probably the best food I ever had. And I would highly recommend it to anyone. I forget the name of the place and I feel really bad about that, but best food that I've had that is uh, culturally diverse. So there's that little plug for Brooks as well. Yeah. But, and, yeah. And, and we have a lot of little restaurants like that and a lot of little different ethnic stores too, you know, uh, you know, that have popped up, uh, uh, you know, to, and sometimes maybe to, to fill the need of their own community, like the Filipino store or things like that too. And I know some of the main uh, grocery stores have tried to, you know, like bring in products that will, you know, uh, you know, look after the, the needs of, you know, the immigrants too, but, yeah, like, like I say, though, that uh, um, we're all immigrants here. We, we've all come from somewhere else, uh, you know, um, so um, uh, except the, the difference. The difference is like my dad came from Eastern Europe and it was predominantly white. And now we're coming from all over the, the, the world. I think we have in our population, we have 1500 Filipinos. We have about uh, 500 people from Somalia, about 480 wow. from Ethiopia, about 380 from uh, Eritrea. And then it goes down and, you know, Colombia, China, uh, the Ukraine. And yeah, we, we have people from everybody here. Uh, it can be a little tough on the school system. Uh, you know, to be honest, because uh, English as a second language, but uh, like I grew up in Drumheller, that was made up of different ethnic groups too. And sometimes the parents struggled. It, it was the kids, uh, you know, they worked hard so the kids could have a better life. And it's probably no different than in Brooks here too. So where do you go in town to get away in the city? I should say because it's the city of Brooks, not the town of Brooks, but where do you go in the city to get away after a long day of meetings, after a stressful day of just being mayor and being John out in the public? Is there a place that you can just go away and just let everything decompress because you know tomorrow morning you're going to have to get up and do the exact same thing over again? Yeah, you know what? I usually go home and if it's not too late, my wife will have supper for me, uh, you know, wait for it. But a lot of times I say, don't wait for me because I never know how long the meetings will go. I, I you know what? I um, We have Lake Stafford here and uh, in the morning, my routine is usually to, you know, go for a walk around Lake Stafford. But but I'm always on call there because I'm running into people. People know who I am. I I. I I do enjoy the rec center. I I enjoy uh, swimming. I, you know, I'll do my uh, my swim in the pool. And the nice thing about the swim is, you know, like I got the forty minutes to myself. I'm not going to run into anybody. Nobody can talk to me. You know, th there's nothing. You know, uh, uh, so those are two things how I like to relax. Yeah, I enjoy the bandits hockey games. I've always been a big bandits fan ever since you know I got into town. Yeah, so uh, th those are. Uh, things I really enjoy there too. So, yeah. I, I have to ask, are the bandits going all the way this year? <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, you know what? We, we enjoyed a lot of success, you know, with the Brooks bandits, you know, they, they've won the Centennial cup uh, for the last uh, three times they've, they've, they've had one. And uh, I, I, you know, as much as uh, I enjoy the success of that team, I want them to have success too. But uh, you know, uh, we have a lot of teams in the league and, and it would be nice uh, sometimes, you know, to have it a little bit more competitive and, and maybe have somebody else come to the top here too, without putting down, the bandits here you know I, I enjoy the success and it's fun to be there and watch them win all all the time too you know uh I, I i don't mind spreading the wealth around a little there too so i want to end on this question here john and it's the million dollar question that i've asked every single person who's ever come on the show so you're no exception um what makes the city of brooks such a unique place to live to work and to raise a family uh, you know, um, uh, going back to, you know, uh, what makes it unique now is um, uh, the uh, our immigrant population, uh, you know, our size, you know, we have great schools, uh, you know, um, th those are nice things. Uh, 
uh, we right now we have a stable workforce. You know, we got the irrigation, but 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 we got a lot. I, I believe we have a lot of stability here too. But uh, what makes it uh, great? Uh, you know, if I, if I have to run out late at night, you know, to get milk or something, you know, like it's not that far away. It's not like going across town. You know, we still have that uh, nice feel. Um, you know, uh, like a great hockey team. You know, or that uh, you know baseball team. You know, good recreation. You know, and. and uh, uh, you know, good rapport with our neighbors in the county. You know, we have a good relationship there. And, you know, like I say, we're two hours away from Calgary, an hour away from Medicine Hat. So, uh, you know, that, that's kind of a feeling too. All I ask is if when, when you're talking to the your MLA, the Premier Smith, in the next few days or a few weeks or a few months, please ask her to fix the cell reception from uh, Strathmore to Brooks because whenever I drive out that way, I lose cell reception within like an hour of leaving Strathmore and I don't get it back till Brooks. So that's my only plug. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. John, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This was an honor to sit down with you. Yeah. Um, I, I say this all the time, but I mean it with respect every time I say yeah. it. Thank you for serving your community. Thank well, you for yeah. step, stepping up and actually being part of your community and wanting it to be better. I think there's not a lot of times that we actually thank our municipal politicians. So I want to start doing that. So thank you so much. So the next time you're in town, call me up. I'm going to tour you around. And then what I'm going to do is feed you a nice steak uh instead of korean food <laughs> i appreciate be, yeah, i appreciate yeah, yeah, yeah. that yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. i will uh, certainly yeah. do that thank yeah. you so much john okay thank you thank you for joining us for another great episode of the cross-border interviews your continued interest in diving deep into the issues that shape our communities across canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission of the show now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support as well. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page, conveniently linked in the show notes, or by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Till next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.